when biotech was coming really to the fore in the 90s, 2000s, um, you know, and there was a lot of talk of ethics then. And I think that was that was a pivotal point in ethics. And I think we're there again with this technology, which also affects biotech, you know. And so it's an interesting time to be alive and be working in these spaces of, you know, creativity as well as science and and seeing the, the rapid change because of course it's exponential and you know within a couple of years I have a friend of mine who studies AI he's a, a neurobiologist and you know that he made that his thing and he was really quite stunned to see how quickly in the past two years this has just developed into mm-hmm. something I, I think at some point kind of going off the tracks right that we don't really know <laughs> Attention all citizens of the future. Buckle up and step into our time tunnel of imagination to join us on an extraordinary journey into the days of futures past. From the fantastical tales of Jules Verne and Isaac Asimov to Buck Rogers and the famous visions of the World's Fair, the future might not be evenly distributed, but it sure ain't what it used to be. So let's go to our guide. That excavator of the eventual, that historian of the hereafter, that recorder of retro futures, Theo Priestley. Hello and welcome again to another episode of Days of Futures Past, where I chat with a special guest around science fiction and what inspired them as a child. Today I have Jendia Gammon, who is the author of science fiction, fantasy and horror novels and short stories. Her books and stories have featured in the Nebula Awards reading lists and the BSFA Awards long list. Uh, Jendia conducts workshops and participates in panels on creative writing for international conventions, and she also holds a degree in ecology and evolutionary biology. Uh, Jendia is also a science writer and an artist, and has also written under the pen name of J. Diane Dotson. Jendia, how are you? I'm doing well, Theo. How are you? I'm doing great. I'm doing great. How is it? Um, whereabouts are you based, actually? Let's start there. Los Angeles. Los Angeles, so right in the thick of, um, I guess, creative country. Very much so, and scientific as well, because we have a lot of universities and we have NASA JPL, so it's an interesting mix. Do you get to see, um, or do you get to actually mix with uh, with that kind of community as well as a science writer? Uh, yeah, occasionally I do, and, and also in my fiction writing, because I consult occasionally certain scientists for getting things accurate in science fiction, which I recently did for a book that I'll be announcing soon. Oh, exciting. Uh, we will definitely uh, try to include uh, all the links for that um, at the end of the show. Um, so there's a, there's a, a, just grabbing onto a hot topic just now then, I guess, there's a, a, a lot of noise and a lot of concern around AI in the uh, creative community and especially in the writing community because it has... I guess, uh, plagiarized and ingested a lot of creative work and then, you know, um, claims to uh, spit out some of its own creative creativity. Does that does that worry um, you and obviously uh, a lot of the writing community that you speak to? It does because it feels like, you know, a lot of it seems to be acquired without consent of the writers that it's taking from. That's part of the problem. Another problem is that, you know, it, it disrupts, our potential path to be successful in writing as a career when there's just this regurgitation of, you know, nonsense that sort of resembles some shape of a story, but what meaning is behind it if it is borrowing from a lot of other things and, you know, then we don't get paid, you know, if there's just regurgitation of free stuff out there. So I find that it's alarming on multiple levels uh, and also from science writing perspective, because a lot of articles are kind of being regurgitated and, I've seen job postings on LinkedIn for editors of AI written articles, which is just like driving editors and writers up the wall. Uh, So, you know, it's, it's a very strange time. Same thing's happening with voice actors, you know? So, you know, we've, we feel like collectively that this is the biggest challenge we've met as writers, you know, that we're suddenly, we've given, we've been given all this opportunity to be able to create in a, in a way that we couldn't, you know, even 10 years ago, and especially for indie authors who have access to Ingram Spark and distribution that we didn't have, and you can make your own book and upload it, but now we're faced with the AI threat. So it's very frustrating because, particularly from my perspective in science, 
in both just regular biological sciences as well as um, medicine and biotech, where you really would like to see more action there for discovery. And I know that is happening with AI, but why don't we not take creative people's work mm. away? Why don't we just help people? So that's kind of my frustration with that, to put it mildly, is that I feel like the focus is in the wrong place. And I very much feel that if you aren't bothered to write something, why would I bother to read it? Mm. Uh, do you think then at some point, I mean, we're seeing it already now with the, with kind of like recursive input and output and AI is obviously cannibalizing itself in terms of what it's actually outputting and then taking it back in as training did. Do you think then at some point there's just going to be a cycle where um, people will start to turn to human curation and human uh, creation again uh, and value that more than this thing, which just seems to be so easy. I mean, if everybody's a creator, I kind of guess that, that nobody is a creator in that sense. I mean, there's there's different ways to look at it, but in terms of the cycle, I think that's already happening as not just as a backlash, but as you know, a a voice of passion for one's own art that we don't want to be lost. That this is our most human technology is art and creating, you know, and communicating. That is just how we've begun as a species to survive to this level and and to express ourselves. So I feel like that's already happening. And I'm really loving seeing particularly smaller and independent press come out and say, we are not using AI art. We are not using AI text, you know, and you know, I've seen some big publishers using AI art, you know, mm. that is troubling a lot of us creatively. Those of us who are both artists and writers, it's incredibly frustrating because, you know, artists deserve to be paid. Writers deserve to be paid, you know, and I, it just, I know that, it's it's very tempting to use something to shortcut, but you have to think about what are the ramifications of it. What are the biases behind it too? And that is an issue I have with AI as well. This inherent well, bias. We've seen, we've seen that with um, with the last Google, um, right? You know, snafu that has taken place, um, and obviously humans are biased in a sense, but AI is yes. kind of sort of amplifying that. Of course, um, yeah, we have to be careful. So there's a lot of ethics involved. It's kind of interesting mm. because. When biotech was coming really to the fore in the 90s, 2000s, um, you know, and there was a lot of talk of ethics then. And I think that was that was a pivotal point in ethics. And I think we're there again with this technology, which also affects biotech, you know. And so it's an interesting time to be alive and be working in these spaces of, you know, creativity as well as science and, and seeing the, the rapid change. Because, of course, it's exponential. And, you know, within a couple of years... I have a friend of mine who studies AI. He's a, a neurobiologist and, you know, that he made that his thing. And he was really quite stunned to see how quickly in the past two years this has just developed into mm. something, I, I think, at some point kind of going off the tracks, right, that we don't really know. I don't think that we can predict how it's going to unfold. But as we've seen with uh, digital music, you know, um, platforms versus analog, like vinyl coming back, I, I do think that there's a sort of renaissance uh, coming and I love seeing things like uh, there's a person that I follow and I'm very keen to work with one day who actually makes, you know, hardcover, makes their own paper, makes their own binding for deluxe hardcover books. And I'm obsessed with that because I feel like that's mm -hmm. a lost art. And, and I have an interesting perspective as the daughter of a woman who worked in publishing, who was a linotype operator. My mother worked in a printing press as a linotype operator for decades, and then computers came on online and made her job obsolete. So I grew up with that knowledge that she had experienced that. And then she did her best to try to learn computing, but it was too late career-wise for her um, to really make that jump. So this is a time in which we must pivot constantly because mm. of exponentially growing technology. And I think keeping the lines of communication open and keeping everything transparent is key and then putting into contracts that what we do and don't want from this technology like i've seen a lot of book and art contracts of no ai you know for the cover no ai for editing or art or whatever so yeah we're right there it's very interesting i, I want to see more of it used for helping people right in medicine and in life than is currently happening and it just seems like the the goals are kind of getting derailed from what could be done. Mm. 
you um you made you mentioned something really interesting we had a quick interaction on over on uh, twitter or x whatever people want to call it these days um about um the renaissance and older tech because i'm starting to see a shift in myself um in wanting physical media to come back and right. there certainly seems to be a love for vinyl dvds uh, we've seen cassettes in japan making a comeback yeah. and people now sort of creating their walkmans um and and it goes towards the fact that I think a lot of people are finding that digital media is beca- is being um, deleted from availability, yes. and and so therefore the only option is to actually resurrect in a sense um, old tech. And now apparently Gen Z are 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 are, are finding a love for fixed landline phones as well now. So I mean um, it's really interesting seeing that shift. Do you think? Again, this is like a, a, a cyclical renaissance, or this is actually driven by the fact that everything has become so digital and can be taken away from it at the drop of a hat that people really want to retain that kind of proof that something exists and that they exist in a sense. Exactly. And it's an interesting it's it's an interesting lens because, you know, as a science fiction writer, we project things that could happen, right? And even in fantasy and horror, the same deal, a speculative fiction universe in which we think about technologies past, present, or future, or impossible in the terms of Mm -hmm. magic, right? Um, That we haven't made the technology yet, for example. And when we see, I'm a Gen X woman with with two Gen Z kids, well, four Gen Z kids with Gareth. So like we, we have these kids growing up with Gen Z that really are embracing older tech. And I think it's beyond nostalgia. I think that is a level of appreciation for craft, you know, and Mm -hmm. I think when things are digitized and regurgitated at that point, it's not really craft anymore. It's not really handmade. Um, And I kind of went through this myself in the eighties. I embraced going back and researching late 1800s technology and trying to do things myself as a kid, like making candles, uh, making clothes, sewing, uh, even grinding coffee beans with an antique, you know, crank hand grinder with a little drawer. And there's value in embracing the things that have always worked and that without power in some cases, you know, or technology could still work. Right. So the sort of back to the land, you know, sustainable farming. And I think that that's it. That's what it is. It's sustainability. This I'm drawing on both my love for history and tech and art and crafts but also in ecology, what can we sustain? Like some of the technology we're seeing is using massive amounts of power and that's Mm -hmm. not sustainable. It just isn't. There's no point to it, you know? So I think it becomes a situation of where do we find the balance between the possibility and then what is and what was and what has always been. And I I like to find that path and I see a lot of us turning and walking that path right now. And and in terms of uh, things that it's like we were talking about, I was we were talking about movies and shows that kind of showed that cassette technology, right? Like That's Alien it, yeah. was sort of embracing like this. They didn't go in all this slick silver futuristic vibe. There were space truckers in like tennis shoes and jeans, essentially more or less, right? And then uh, the reboot for Battlestar Galactica, where you know to circumvent the cyber tech issue of um, the threat that they have on hand. They have like landline <laughs> on Galactica, like Galactica actual, you know, like Adama's got his corded phone. I love that because I kind of feel like there's, there's no reason we can't have all of these things if they're working for us and not against us, you know, mm. and, and anytime something is a classic, it's a classic for a reason, you know, and, you know, we, works if it ain't broke don't fix it kind of situation and so i love to see the value in rediscovering and you know and working within those bounds of history and technology for future tech and possibility and and in my book um under my j diane dodson pin name the end at the amethyst lantern is set in a post-climate future a post-climate disaster future where we've come back around at least a small society and We've done things a little differently. And this is like 500 years in the future in which, you know, we've incorporated nature and ecology and the adaptations to a harsher climate 
as have the plants and animals in it. And then working within that different realm of technology. And some of it is very old tech, tech and some of it is new and, and, and just figuring out where are we as a society. And I think that we can walk those paths. So we don't need to just suddenly toss everything out that isn't new anymore. You know, mm. I think, and it's hard in this day and age, with such an immediacy and wanting to log into algorithms and analytics and things like that. But we're, we're, we're not seeing the forest for the trees. In a sense, you know, cassette futurism, um, it brings back a, a case of, you know, you mentioned if it ain't broke, don't fix it. But if it does break, we can fix it because yeah, it is that. That, that, yeah, yeah, you know, it's practical. And I think with everybody pushed towards digital, we like you say, we lose that skill in being able to understand how technology really works because we've relinquished that control yeah, to the algorithm and on other to the bits and well. bytes. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So you, you you mentioned that you're Gen X and same as me, I was born in 72. Um, so, you know, what, the, you know, it was a rich, rich time, you know, we, we're still in the midst of or just about to, to see the end of the, the moon landings, in a sense. Um, and then we were creeping into sort of like the Cold War and the 80s and the threat of nuclear annihilation right. and things. But there was also so much fresh science fiction and good movies coming out, you know, when we were growing up. Yes. I mean, what was what was the what was the big science fiction influences for you back then? Well, when I was three years old, I saw this movie about this farm boy on a desert planet with two sons <laughs> and some laser swords, and I thought that Alderaan was Earth being destroyed. <laughs> so that was my first movie that I can remember seeing in a theater. It probably was the first one I ever sat through. I'm sure my parents brought me along as like an infant or something, but that was my formative first movie experience. Star Wars, you know, what is now A New Hope. And um, I was obsessed instantly with that. I loved also at home, there were the reruns because we only had three channels before cable <laughs> came online of um, Lost in Space and Star Trek, uh, the original series. Things that my parents had loved, uh, they were from the silent generation. They were born during the Great Depression, but they had wonderful science fiction to, to grow up with. Mm. And, and as well as magnificent technology, horrible and beautiful at the same time. And, you know, so talk about a fascinating time to have been born for my parents and seeing the tremendous change going from, you know, being a paper girl to working on social media, you know, like my mom. So crazy to think about. Right. So in terms of that, I, I went from there and then saw some things at way too young an age, much like the rest of my generation. For example, John Carpenter's The Thing, which I watched, mm. I think I was about age eight or so, watched it alone in a cold basement in the dark. And let me tell you that that is a formative experience that lasts a <laughs> lifetime. Might explain my obsession with creepy stuff set in the polar north or south. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> hey, south because Antarctica. But you know, it's I love the thing. It's still in my top three favorite movies of all time. Loved very much. I, I watched Aliens before I saw Alien. Taught mm. myself to swear very well with that film, um, and scared a lot of my cohort teen gal pals at slumber parties with that movie, and it was delicious. Um, but I also was very much obsessed with sort of crossover sci-fi, kind of like Back to the Future and Ghostbusters. And I really loved fantasy a great deal. You know, we had Conan the Barbarian, we had Legend, we had uh, Labyrinth, you know, it just, it was an incredible time to have movies that kind of bridged all those gaps in horror too. Love Nightmare on Elm Street a lot. Obviously I mentioned The Thing and Alien. Um, all these different threads pulling together and inspiring me to create my own stories, my own space operas, my own scary stories, my own fantasy worlds. And I feel like those experiences we got to see with, for example, Terminator being an obvious choice, but also Alien, where you have, mm -hmm. you know, a robot future run amok or sinister on some level. But we also saw gentle robots like R2-D2 and C-3PO and, you know, helper bots and things like that. And I love telling stories about both kinds. Uh, it also it's, 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 it was a really fun and rich environment to grow up in and just have your imagination go crazy, you know, and cartoons too. You know, like I, mm. I was obsessed with Transformers and He-Man and She-Ra, but also Robotech. Um, Mike Chen, when are we going to write that duo? 
anyway, so, and then we've talked about this before. Anyway, so, and then two um, Mighty Orbots, which the five of us who have watched that show really love, and Dungeons and Dragons cartoon, and then X-Men, and then everything that came later. It's, so it's a lot of anime and great new animation that helped form that too. And you could, you could tell a lot of really great stories with low tech, with animation mm. before CGI came on board. It was masterful. So yeah, it was a great time to grow up, honestly. And and throughout that time then, I mean, were you always thinking about, well, I'm going to write about these worlds that I'm seeing now? Or or were you thinking about a different path, you know, you, you know, during career in college? Or was it that was it? You know, those first formative years and those first films just kind of cemented it in your brain that this was this was what I was going to do. Well, I always, I originally had thought, because I'm an artist too, the art and the writing developed at the same time. And I came up with maybe thousands of illustrations of galactic fashions for my characters in the eighties. And they're, I have them in big, thick albums and uh, they are, you know, they would make the most avant-garde French designer blush, just outrageous, <laughs> stuff, um, full of vibrant color and all these whimsical attachments and things. And I'm remaking some of those and coming up with new ones all the time. So I kind of felt like, and, and in that side of it, that side of world building of costume and, and fashion, that's a whole nother topic I could spend days talking about because it's essential, I think, as is mm. food. But when I was growing up, before 1986, I was convinced that one day I would be an astronaut and I would make it to Mars. And then the Challenger happened. Mm. So, and it didn't dissuade me from becoming an astronaut. And in fact, when I went to high school and I spoke to my advisor, I said, I'm thinking I'd like to be an astronaut. And she was like, well, you might want to do Air Force. Um, and so I thought about that long and hard. And I thought she's probably right. I know I wouldn't absolutely need to, but that probably wouldn't be a bad idea. But life, the universe and everything kind of interfered. And I got derailed from a lot of dreams for a lot of not great reasons. And ultimately decided, you know, I've always had, in addition to the writing and the art, the love for nature, the love for space, the, the love for biology. And I thought, I could go the easy route and do art or I could go the hard route and do science. So I chose to go the hard route and did science and I'm glad I did. I'll never regret that. And then eventually I started writing in science. So, and it, you know, it informs uh, at some level, my fiction, not totally, but it does occasionally. And so I felt that it was, it was the right call for me to do science. I've worked in ecology as well as clinical research um, for cancer and, and diseases. So, and I even, was accepted for a master's program in epidemiology, which if I had continued would have led to a very interesting past four years in this decade. Um, I withdrew because my, my young children were just not ready for me to be away. And honestly, I wasn't either. So I ended up volunteering for their school uh, and then being a science writer. So, but you know, I, the science was such a draw, but that also kind of leaned into the things that I watched growing up because there was always a science element to it. Right. And then when the X-Files came along, I thought, oh, my God, well, I used to be Mulder and I'm totally Scully now. And I you know, <laughs> seized on that. She was such an important role model right at the time I was entering university. And again, I have no regrets. I've worked with DNA. I've worked with RNA. You know, I've worked with um, plants and animals and everything in between. And, uh, and now I write about it. So it's just but writing was something I always did. It was all, as soon as I could draw, as soon as, as soon as, as soon as I started writing stories, I was illustrating them. And sometimes I even wrote comics um, for myself, you know, and mm. I always knew that I would be writing books one day. I just didn't know the path. And when I was 13, I had finished an entire novel. What is the bones of now the questions on saga it was a novel space opera. And then I wrote its sequel. So, and then my English teacher in eighth grade, when I, she was, she approached publishing companies on my behalf. And, you know, I actually heard back from one of them and I still have the letter and they were like, you know, we really admire what you're doing. And if you're really serious, here's the submission guidelines. And they said, but you are rather young and you might want to hone your craft, but if you want to go ahead and submit, here you go. And I just, again, life happened and I put on the brakes. And so I, I didn't, I would write in the margins of school and science and life. And then I came back to it later. And so finally got to where finally had my books in the world. And now I'm kind of trying to make another career leap, trying to break into big five, but I'm very pleased with how small press is treating me too and getting accolades for it. So like, you know, I, this is a good place for me to be. 
And so you started quite young, and and obviously yes. you were you were given a lot of um, encouragement by by your teachers. Yeah. Um, uh, do you see that still happening today? That uh, the kids are uh, are wanting to aspire to write, and and they're getting that kind of support, or is there a mismatch in in, in school just now? Well, I think my children are very fortunate that they have received probably from people in my generation, mostly mm. um, the inspiration to do that and the encouragement. Uh, so it's there. Yes, absolutely. It's there. I Maybe it's not there for every child, but I sure wish it were. Um, I think my both my kids are brilliant writers and I, I, I didn't teach them to do that. Right. <laughs> like, that's them, you know, and they, all, all four of them are just so amazingly creative. My kids and Garrett's kids and then just, that, so they've, they've got the encouragement. They've had the inspiration and they've really run with it. And and so going back to your childhood then, I mean, you've, you've cited Alien and, and The Thing, which is, again, one of mine and, and, and um, favorites and Star Wars and Star Trek. I mean, throughout all of that, and we've talked about cassette futurism as well. You know, are there any specific pieces of technology that you've seen in these movies or certainly read in other people's books that you've thought to yourself, oh, I really wish we had this today. This would make my life so much better today. Well, you know, it's interesting when Star Trek Next Generation came online, I instantly gravitated towards the replicator, <laughs> uh, mainly because I was like, well, sure, I'd like what I really was thinking with it was not the food or anything, but actually I was thinking in terms of fashion. I was mm. thinking that um, I I sew, but I can't really like, I've never been trained to sew like costumes and outfits, but I thought if I had a replicator and I could replicate certain things um, from my imagination, for example, like I would like to make this and have it printed. Um, but then again, I think, well, it'd be a lot more fun if I just did it myself from scratch. And so mm. I have started to kind of do that by hand. Um, so I used to think that would be awesome. And I think now we've got, you know, 3d printed food coming online and that's probably pretty close to replication there. Um, so, but I'm a baker and a cook. So actually it's kind of at this point, I'm like, yeah, you know, I don't need a replicator. I'm doing this pretty well on my own, but, uh, teleportation now I think would be quite, quite useful, especially having a long distance marriage. (laughs) I'd like to just be able to walk into another room and and my husband be there, you know, and back and forth. So teleportation, we are nowhere near that. Um, Mm -hmm. Other technology that I've always admired. um, Let's see. Let me think. I I like, we talked briefly about, you have a book there on Elysium. Um, I like sustainable stations. Of course, in Heliopause, Equestrians on Saga Book 1, I have a space station on the cover that's Mandira Research Station, and I'm always fascinated by space stations and how how you can make them sustainable for a population over a period of time and what kind of technology they have. So I mm-hmm. love that. And, you know, Elysium is a good later example. But I was always like zeroing in when I would watch Star Trek II, The Wrath of Khan. I really loved Dr. Carol Marcus and identified with her on several letters, levels and still do because can I cook or can't I, you know? <laughs> So, um, but they were on, you know, a science station and that's just totally my jam. I'm just obsessed with that kind of tech and making better stations, um, as bases or as research environments. That's the science side of me kind of wanting to experiment there and, and make them livable little places to be. And, and I loved, um, I love just embracing, exploring, you know, the exploration aspect of Star Trek and also mm. Star Wars and, and even Alien and Aliens in the negative, the flip side of it being, you know, space is hard and we don't know what's out there, sort of cosmic horror element to it all. I, I wish that we could, you know, have FTL or, you know, be somewhere faster than light, you know, warp drive, something. We're not there yet. Those kinds of things. I mean, I kind of always saw things like tricorders coming along faster because that's mm. kind of logical. So I never really was like, oh, I can't wait for that day because I just assumed that was going to happen. And we were very close, right? Um, we're almost there. So, but yeah, those were my those were my favorites. And I, of course, love the idea of a lightsaber, but um, I would rather have a more practical use, even though it would be kind of fun because I actually practice longsword fighting but I, I okay so you'd be quite deadly with it then i would be look out so but i would also be very good at cutting cake with it so there's that <laughs> <laughs> now 
Now, your ecology side of things. I mean, there's a couple of um, science fiction uh, movies that spring to mind. One of them is Wally because it's an animated feature um, and yeah. it has a very strong ecological message. But the the other one, which is one of my favourites, is um, Silent Running. Oh, you mentioned I love Silent Help. Running. Yeah, because you mentioned helper robots, yeah. and then there's yeah. obviously, and, and then there's space stations, uh, yep. which I, I guess you could say it was, but obviously it was Their one with ships, a, a yeah. very yeah a, a purpose. Um, I mean, it was quite dark at the end, but yes. especially um, the fact that it, it would seem that the Earth was a complete mess, and then they would just actually just yeah. wanted to terminate all the yeah. other forest ships. Um, and and it always makes me cry that Joan Baez track at the end always makes me cry yeah. when you see yeah. the little ro- lone robot tending to the garden. Now, do you tend to sort of lean more towards dystopian kind of science fiction when you write, or do you always look for a more hopeful message? Um, which obviously that one didn't really have, but you know, a hopeful message that we can sort of aspire to something at the end of uh, at the end of science fiction. I do both um, because I do dip into horror. And so, but, you know, with the end at the Amethyst Lantern, which I mentioned before, that is a hopeful future in which we took a bad situation and we adapted in a very unique way. And it's under threat from a villain from our time, kind of like Ralph Khan. So, um, <laughs> and yeah, I think anybody who reads it and reads the villain will know exactly the kind of person I'm talking about. So that's kind of fun and delicious. But, um, you know, I, I have stories in which we, you know, especially in the Shadow Galaxy, which is a mix of sci-fi, fantasy, and horror under my Dotson pen name, there's stories where you have space miners that come across something quite sinister. Um, and that's a future that would not be great to experience, right? So, and that's kind of more in line with Alien and The Thing, um, a little bit of Event Horizon, you know. But I think, though, I, I walk both lines because I think in that spectrum, I think in terms of, what could happen if, and then, so you have this path of like, well, it could go very well, it could go very badly. And so I write kind of in between and, and at the ends of those spectra. So, you know, um, and someone asked me when I was writing the questions on site, when I had heliopause coming out before the sequels, ephemeris, accretion, luminiferous, they said, cause I said it was um, in the 23rd century, late 23rd century. And they said, are we still around? And I thought, Ooh, that's a good question. And I said, I think we will be, you know, but we really need to be paying close attention to how we're living and how we're helping each other. Because that's it at the end of the day is if we're not helping each other. What are we doing? What are we doing? Mm. You know, and that is the end of it. It's like looking outside of ourselves and helping others, you know, being other centered is the goal. And not just for humanity, but for animals and plants, and fungi and this living universe that we find ourselves in which is a dynamic one and in which we have not been here very long you know compared to the rest of it so i think yeah. having that intention is is good but writing about the flip side or playing them in that sphere is is a lot of fun to speculate what so you again you mentioned that you know but are we still here and uh, the things that we have to do to motivate ourselves to basically become a community, but also symbiotic with with the Earth. I mean, the Earth has what is it? Is it's Earth Day? I think it is, where our our consumption of natural resources exceeds what the Earth can give us, and that day becomes sooner and sooner as every calendar year clocks on. I mean, how could how do you think we could take lessons from science fiction that have been written in the past, and obviously, and obviously visions of the future? Um, back in the days from the you know the early thirties, forties, fifties during World's Fair and stuff like that, how could we take those lessons and actually start to, I guess, propagate them across society to make people aware that there are better things to do or better thing, uh, things that things that could be done better than what we are doing now, or is it just kind of like a lost cause? We're we're on this track and we just can't get off it. I will never believe that we are on a lost cause track we've made it so far through incredible difficulty Mm. it's magnificent that we've made it as far as we have and we've faced you know planet killing threats now for several decades you know the atomic age was a wake-up call of Mm. saying wow we could just end all of this very quickly with the press of a button you know and then like the the adventures of baron munchausen movie you know like it was like well where's the fun in that (laughs) you know very dark. But anyway, um, at the same time, though, 
I, I feel like this is where it comes back kind of full circle to human made craft and human mm -hmm. purpose and human bias and all of this. And I feel very strongly that as long as we have expression and as long as we have art and we have inspiration and we have education for younger generations and for the current generations, it's not for everybody, you know, and that is not disrupted. You know, there is always the ability to learn and to move forward. And also, we also need to lean, I think, a bit into some very old ideas of community connectivity across cultures, not just Western cultures, you know, like Eastern cultures, far Northern cultures, indigenous cultures have a lot mm. to offer in how to survive and how to maintain creativity and community and family and friendship and, you know, healing so there's a lot that we can learn from what we've already seen and we can build on that. And I just really, I will never give up on us. That's a hopeful message indeed. And especially since uh, the future still has to be uh, largely human and not automated. Otherwise we, we really have lost our way. Um, Diane, where can we find more about you and the books and your work that you're doing? Thank you. I have a website that lists my books and ways to connect. And so that is jendiagammon.com, J-E-N-D-I-A-G-A-M-M-O-N.com slash books. And then you'll find all my links to short and long fiction under both my pin names. And there will be some new ones to add very soon. Well, um, I can't wait for that to come out, um, uh, your new book, and I will certainly put that on the watch list for sure. And um, those links will be available in the show notes for anyone who's watching. Jendia, thank you very much for giving us your time today. Thank you, Theo. It's been a pleasure. Um, that's it for another episode of Days of Futures Past. Um, please join me again next time where I will chat with another guest around science fiction and what inspired them as children. Um, bye bye for now. This is Days of Futures Past, signing off, when we'll once again peel back the curtain on more lost futures. Stay tuned, and remember, the future may be here, but the past never fades. Until next time. Days of Futures Past was brought to you by Theo Priestley, keynote speaker, author, and retrofuturist. If you'd like to appear as a guest and reminisce about futures gone by, get in touch. I've been your radio host, Andrew Helbig. Goodbye for now.